Welcome to Opera Holland Park, just in the process of setting up for their annual summer season. And we're delighted to say we're going to be here with a special word in your park on June the 18th to celebrate the 80th birthday of James Paul McCartney in the company of Danny Baker, Julia Rayside, Andy Miller, Jeff Lloyd and Graham Goldman in this fabulous arena which has the combination of a roof that keeps the rain off but sides that allow the sunlight and the air in. If you came last year, you won't need reminding. If you didn't come last year, make sure you come this year. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Yeah. Welcome to well, another Word in your attic and to another old pal of ours uh, who whenever he hosts interview, donkeys tend to fear for the safety of their hind legs <laughs> <We're doing laughs> the, the record promoter uh, pr man uh, label director uh, the harmonica player on culture club records and various others and, and even a former puppeteer it can only be judd lander judd how lovely to see yeah. you how are you All nice right? to see you i the hubcaps yeah. yeah. <laughs> now the, then. Yeah. Now then. <laughs> Another Liverpudlian stereotypes, <laughs> which it, we will be exploring. Yeah. 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 Very good. So, so you, by the way, so do you like the badge? Yes. Yes. I'm good. sorry. We, I, you probably got. Oh, you said JL. It says JL on there. It says the reason customer. being a little bit of trivia. Go on. I was the one that created all those badges for the whistle test. No, go on. It's a true story, and I've got the invoice from the BBC. Mike Appleton, I had a chat with Mike and the guys, and I loved the logo at the back, the kicking uh, star kicker. And I said, that would be cool as a badge. I bought a print machine courtesy of CBS's money, and I started, I think I pumped down to about 150, and then my PA done another 150, and we got cheesed off with it. And I said to Mike, I can't do it anymore. So we went through a manufacturers and done it properly. But all, all those badges were my little idea. And, uh, Absolutely. And it was great seeing Clapton and people wearing them. I was saying, that's cool. But there you go. Bit of trivia. Brilliant. That's very good. I never knew that. The, the way we normally start these chats, Judd, is, yeah. is ask people if they can remember what record-playing machinery was in your home when you were a child. Can you remember? Yes, I can. It was, uh, is it a done set? It was a very basic, uh, you open it up like a coffin, but a little portable, uh, a makeup case, more like a makeup case. Oh, right. Okay. And, and I've forgotten the name of it, but I, 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 it was a reject from a neighbor because we didn't have that much money. So I got this thing. And do you know the first record I bought? Cyril Davis, Country Line Special. Oh, what? Harmonica player. Oh, exactly. And to this day, I'm still playing with my old band from Liverpool. And what, what do we do in the set? Country Line Special. Cyril, so this, no, tell us about the group. Nobody talks to Alan Cyril Davis. Sorry. So, no, tell us about the group. This was the Hideaways. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And we certainly did hide away because we never had a hit. Um, we were stuck in Liverpool. We were the, 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 the bright new hope. In Liverpool, after the Beatles and the Merseys, everybody had gone. And all the A&R departments had say, said, we've had enough of Liverpool, let's go to Scotland. So we were left. We were the young kids that came along. And uh, Bob Wooler and, uh, 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 then realised that they had, you know, um, something there at the cavern. So they created the cavern agency. And we became the, one of the first bands on the agency. We were only 15. But we were all pretty young kids and all that bit. Then, then the, um, the commercial company started thinking, hang on, Liverpool, we like the tag, hit the youth market. So Timex Watches decided to do a TV ad at the cabin. And we were there and we ended up doing five gigs in one day at the cabin club. Uh, one was doing the advert first thing in the morning, the junior session in the afternoon, evening session. We went away, done... Um, uh, another gig somewhere and then came back for the all-nighter so we were all shattered after the whole uh, event but the advert you can still see online if you google timex watches at the cavern or the hideaways at the cavern you'll see a very young me playing guitar i must admit i look quite good not so much <laughs> now I'm chunky old and gray <laughs> and you played you the cavern more times than the Beatles, isn't that? Isn't that well, well, we're still playing it. I'm playing it in a couple of weeks' time. I do a charity thing for Strawberry Fields. We helped uh, 
fund the build uh, at Strawberry Fields now, helping all you know underprivileged kids and that. So we still play every year, but we've we've done we've surpassed over. 506 i reckon we've done it about six or seven hundred times now and and there, there are records uh, somewhere of cavern club performance but don't forget with being with the actual cavern agency where there was a dropout whether the hollies couldn't make it because of snow or long john baldry had found some new lover up in london um you know we ended up filling in all those slots so there are so many slots that we've done, which aren't publicised. So, yeah, I, I reckon well over 600. Right. So where did you go to buy records in Liverpool in those days? Did oh, you go to I ended, so uh, yes. No, Rushworth and Drapers, where the Beatles bought their guitars. And, um, oh, who was that? Um, there was a lovely lady behind the counter, and we used to say to her, have you got any imports? Oh, yeah, I've got one by John Lee Hooker. Oh, can we have a listen? And we go into a little booth with a little writing pad and we say, could you put it back on again? Could you put it back on again? And we'd be writing the lyrics down and re learning the songs in the booths. So that was Rushworth, which was very key. Just along the road in Whitechapel was NEMS. And that was yeah. NEMS Record Store, which is Epi's place. And uh, that's, that's where we used to get a lot of imports. And again, all the bands were trying to find new repertoire. And, uh, and the time, at the time, we were a blues band, but there were lots of other bands, you know, um, like, uh, you know, doing Righteous Brothers, uh, the Hollies songs, and all the Hollies, you know. Yeah, so everyone, all the bands used to go in there. And, 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 you know, seek new repertoire. Uh, I ended up uh, getting a job there and I've still got the actual, I think, how much did they get? Ten and sixpence. But I've still got my actual employment thing. And at the bottom, the girl said, and Judd, don't be late, because she knew I was gigging all the time. So, and, and so I was privy to getting all the hot, stuff, hot numbers coming in. Arrival, uh, they, one of the girls there used to work uh, with me. In, uh, in, in at NEMS, and of course, Arrival went on to be a very successful. <laughs> Sorry, didn't 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 they join Kokomo? Didn't some of them join? That's it. Kokomo? Yes, yes, they were uh, the precursor to Kokomo, and right. uh, so they went on and done well. But the hideaway still <laughs> remained in the cellar and not seeking fame. So I'm still seeking fame. So if there's anyone there that can help me, then please do. <laughs> so when did you first get, when did you first come to London, Joe? Well, that was interesting because um, I used to uh, hang out with Neil Aspinall, who was uh, with the Beatles, and uh, and Nell and I. Uh, well, it was Nell's friend who, who I knew very well. That's how we got into the inner circle. So he popped to Liverpool to see uh, Pete and Mo. Because you know, well, he has a he had a he's got a song called Rogue. We won't go into that, but yeah, anyway, no, we know. So yeah, yeah so he, he used to pop uh, uh, up to Liverpool all the time. So we used to go out with him, and um, uh, I, 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 it, it, the thing about London was like a bit of a magnet. And then the Mercy Beats kindly said, "Judd, we're doing a session in um, Hyde Park uh, Studios in Hyde Park. I think it was Decca." Anyway, he said, look, we're, we need a harmonica on a track called Penny in My Pocket. And I went, oh, fantastic. Oh, I'm going to London. So I ended up going to London, went in, and uh, Dick Leakey was the producer, assistant producer. Jack ba Baverstock was the producer. For, uh, for all you young people, he was a, a guru of a producer. And Dick Leakey eventually became um, well, publisher for Wham. So anyway, so Dick, the, the, uh, the Merseys were all you know, in the studio, I'm really excited, I'm hyper, and unbeknown to me, and this is Billy Kinsley, the bass player, the Mercy tells me the story about how Neil Aspinall was trying to get me to go to Abbey Road, which is only 10 minutes up the road from Hyde Park, to play on Lady Madonna. And I played on their track, and it was the biggest flop the Mercy's ever had. <laughs> so I could have been... You could have been on Lady on, Madonna. I you could have, but, but oh. I didn't pass the audition. But that was in the days of no mobiles because Neil was trying to call uh, my, my mom in Liverpool. And um, yeah, but anyway, that's a. No, the, so that got me in the bug of doing session work. And then I started doing uh, well, with Val Tunican, which is very funny because the first session I've ever done uh, where I've had to read the scores and I didn't read. And I went into this session, the booker had picked me, said, Go into the session, George, you know, they're already. 
And I normally went in when the thing was done and I'd just overdub, which is always easy. You go back, go back and do it. Now I'm with the live orchestra. And the Vernon girls with their Liverpool bunch of uh, <laughs> fucking singers were standing right next to me. And she knew that I was wobbling in my trousers. And she said, what? I said, I don't know where I'm going to come in. I, I don't read. She said, I'll kick you when your bar comes. True story. Uh, they came up, da -da 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 kick, and I was out. And we had to do it again. And I was so embarrassed, but did I get it right? And then after that, all the bookers that called me up, I said, it's not a live session, is it? <laughs> I refused <laughs> to do live sessions. But um, I, yeah, I ended up playing with Twiggy, uh, the Walker Brothers. Oh, I've got a checkered past. Oh my goodness, I don't want to go there. But some so great you did, you did loads of you, you, you were kind of a specialist harmonica player, and there presumably weren't that many around. Is that fair to say? Well, well, that was the beauty, yeah, because I played a bit of guitar. Everyone played guitar, everyone, and it was the harmonica which you can stick in your pocket. No port, Rich. It was the easiest piece. <laughs> yes. But I did realize Perfect. I had to get a harmonica for every note of the piano. Which did cost me a few bob, but um, but it was just a an oddball instrument, and I got you know became very much into Nan Nazareth called me up, um, and, and 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 it was the Nazareth session that got me into working in internally with record companies because Nazareth uh, were with I think it was BNC Mooncrest, and yes. um, <clears throat> and they were linked with Charisma Records, and I met they Gail Colson. And Tony Stratton Smith, and they loved my cheek. And uh, Tony said, "Have you ever plugged a record?" And Gail said, "Well, with this speak, he should do well." And they gave me a Genesis record to promote. And I went to John Peel, and I had to blag my way through the BBC security. Well, being a scouser, it was easy peasy. So um, I went through, got up there, I said to Peel, "He said, I'm a scouser. I'm working for Charisma. I've got a great record." And he looked at me and he said, who is it? I said, Genesis. He said, I've been playing them for ages. Well, I don't know that, do I? But I've got this new... Anyway, uh, we went... <laughs> and I convinced, I, convinced, I convinced Genesis to do a single. And I was talking to... Because I was saying to uh, Gail and Tony Stratton, if we get on the playlist, that single could help sell the albums. And they said, yeah, good idea. And we got them to do an edit. I think they took 30 seconds off a five-minute number rather than cut it down to three. And Tony was very reluctant, the manager, and, uh, and the whole band were. Anyway, we got it away. Top of the Pops calls me. John, Robin Nash here. Robin we love the Nash. boys on the show. Uh, I, I, they don't want to do it. They have to do it, darling. They have to do it. This is Top of the Pops. Anyway, the band turned me down. I remember seeing Peter Gabriel about 20 years later on a flight going to Italy. And he came over and sat next to me. We were having a laugh. And he said, I'm awfully sorry. I didn't really. Well, we did want to do it, but we didn't want to do it, if you know what I mean. And uh, each one of them I've met and I've apologized. They've obviously felt very guilty all those years. But there you go. A gen uh, and Chris Charisma record for me was fantastic. I had a field day there. And, and Linda's farm. I was very ill once. I went into the hospital and I think it was stressed because I was very hyper, as you can tell now. Uh, you know, I was always a hyper guy. And I ended up in Barnet General with a, a perforated ulcer. So I was really poorly. And um, anyway, I'm in intensive care. And the next morning, the nurse comes in. I'm getting a little bit better. And she said, what a nice. I said, what was wrong? She said, some drunkard from Newcastle was trying to get in to see you. You're in intensive care. No one should. I said, who was it? He called himself Alan Bull from Lindisfarne. I said, yeah, 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 he's a singer. She said, oh, well, we threw him <laughs> out. He was pissed. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, I got a letter from uh, Jeff Griffin and, um, and Bob Harris. Bob, Bob Harris. I get a, uh, a, a, tele a telegram from them saying, Judd, well, sorry to hear you're so ill. Don't worry, we're not going to play any of your records till you get better. Oh, the... <laughs> God. Anyway, there you go. So, so that this, was, this, that was, uh, this, that was this is what 1973, 74 kind of thing we're talking about. Yeah, now, yeah. Are we? right, yeah. right, right, right. Didn't you work on ah, the John I, Lennon I, rock and roll album as well? I did, yes. And um, I'm just looking for trivia here. I oh, still have the watch. Oh, that's fantastic. That and a another bit of trivia. Boy, that must be valuable. 
Can you see that? Hold it a bit yeah, Beatles yeah, fang. Yeah. Oh, come on. That's good. Hold that up a second. That's good. This is to certify that Judd is an officially enrolled member of the fan club and has become Beatle person number one. <laughs> you, you can't ask for anything better. They say than that. that to all the girls. <laughs> yes, uh, I know. Well, I've got loads of trivia. You know, I've got, well, recently I've just seen ABBA. Uh, can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. ABBA was. That's from yeah, that's the ja Japanese tour. Yeah. And do you remember? The Asbury Jukes. The Asbury Jukes, nice. of course. Southside, love Southside, he loved me because he played harmonica, as I did. Oh, of course he did. Of course he did. And we do like the... The, the... the Dream Police. Yes, true, true. Yeah. Very good. So trick. Diddle I, diddle I, diddle I, diddle I, do it. Yeah. <laughs> do you... So you worked for CBS, did you? Yeah, because that's what happened then with Charisma. We were doing great, and, uh, really hit after hit after hit. And I was then getting into, you know, how to do PR properly, I suppose. Um, and Clive Selwyn, who was the director at CBS, also managed Clifford T. Ward. And I'd promoted Clifford's album and we'd had the number one with Gay. So Clive was impressed with my, um, how can I say, uh, my, my devious ways of getting a, a slow track played. Uh, and he lured me over to Epic. And that's when... Uh, uh, I sort of became head of Epic uh, PR uh, on the radio side with you, someone you know, Jonathan Morris. So oh, Jonathan, yeah, Jonathan was, Morris, of course. Yeah, so Jonathan was head of press and I was head of uh, the radio and TV side. And uh, of course... Can I, then, can I just say that yeah. anybody who knows Jonathan and knows you, you're, you're a, a, a better illustration of the difference Jordan between press and promotion <laughs> couldn't possibly be devised. Jonathan, who's very, very quiet, and you're not, I think it's fair to say, because that, that's what you need in radio promotion, isn't it, Judd? I mean, to be honest, you've got, you've got to be kind of brass necked, haven't you, in, in oh, that world? Oh, oh, well, totally. I mean, you know, with Jonathan, as you say, you know, he, unless you meet him at the Groucho, at two in the morning. He's slightly different, Jonathan, then. But normally he's quite quiet and and and, and sensible, whereas me, I was like the rebel, a scouser. What well, my expenses, I couldn't believe they gave me a, a, a credit card. I, that, that credit card went platinum within the first two weeks of, uh, you know, having it. I just went mad with the card. Uh, Ted Beston had 15 lunches in one day. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, uh, John Peel, I think I bought every veggie restaurant around the Soho. I mean, I had a great time. I was, it's like a, a, a boy in a sweet shop. And, um, you know, it's sort of going up. I always thought of devious ways of trying to get the attention of uh, the playlist committee, which was very important in the old days, where radio would have their meeting on the fifth floor of Egton House at the BBC. And um, they'd sit there at 10 o'clock, all smoking with the windows open. So I and a couple of other bloggers used to bung the fellas with their little cleaning or, or you know, apparatus, and we pull ourselves up. And it was on one occasion, I'd done that for the Kane Gang, uh, Closest Thing to Heaven. I was working the track, and I thought, Closest Thing to Heaven, they're on the fifth floor, bung the fella a fiver, and I put all the records in his little bin, and up I pulled up the side of the BBC, and as I got to the window, I could see them all smoking away with Doreen at the end, giving it plenty, and I threw all the records through the window. And the records came flying back at me, almost decapitated me. <laughs> and then I zoomed down and done a runner. Anyway... Uh, you weren't the person who, who, who had a, a, the crane that delivered the chicken dinners for, for ZZ Chop Top's uh, TV dinner was, single. Because that was obviously uh, Nick from your idea, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. well, everyone nicked my idea. There, there, there was another funny one. The Ram Jam Band, Black Betty. Yeah. I hired an actress and I called her Betty. Anyway, she, I got her from, uh, uh, you know, the equity, the equity book or whatever. I bunged her some money and said, listen, go in early uh, to the BBC. I'll get you in. Put a pile of records in your, in your bag. In, the, in your buckets and pretend you're late and just apologise to everybody else that you go in. I'm sorry I'm very late. My son was in the recording studio all night and uh, I was just worried about it. And she went around. She was great. She'd done it. Larger-than-life character. 
uh, hello, sorry I'm late. And Chris Lai said, oh, you know, uh, it's all right, leave it till late. Oh, yeah, here's a record my son told me I should give it to you. And she put it round and it's, whoa, Black Betty, bam, alam, bam. got on the playlist straight away and became a bloody big smash. I used to do, there are so many things. I've sent posted myself to a record, uh, to a, a radio station. I'd do anything, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, sorry, that's a little thing there. Uh, yeah, I work with, uh, bless his cotton sock, Marvin, I, I I am the one, and we put it on record now, who broke Bat Out of Hell. I can say, yes, you, 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 you should oh, tell me. We, ask you you about should, that. we yeah. were talking about this when we met the other week. Go on, you, t- tell us that story. Yes, go on. Well, Steve Popovich, uh, when I joined Epic, I mean, the, the joys of joining an international company are that you get to travel. So, uh, I was invited over to New York uh, for a conference and I was there and I buddied up with Steve Popovich and Steve, you know, it, it was from a similar background to me, a working background, you know, uh, and uh, he, you know, Cleveland boy, uh, but he was a great guy and very, very passionate about his music. Southside Johnny loved him to death. Uh, Steve Van Zandt was his best mate. Springsteen loved him. Anyway, I bonded with him and we used to have a laugh. And I remember him taking me to ABGB's and we were there just you know, having a drink and whatever. And this little girl came up and started hustling. Steve, oh, go away, man, go away. So I said, who's that? She said, her name's Madge. She's a singer. Madonna. She was trying to blag a deal back oh. then. Anyway, so we really got on well. And he told me, he said, look, he said, um, he said we're talking to uh, the Jacksons. We're going to drag them over uh, to Epic, you know. I want to get the band, but we're really focusing in on Michael. So anyway, they eventually done the deal with that. I got the tip off with that. Uh, they got the Jacksons over. And then, of course, Michael then went solo, which is the whole uh, Yetnikov wanted it. He had the money. He paid the deal. So I ended up working with closely with Michael and with uh, the Jacksons. But getting back to uh, meet, uh, what happened there? Steve eventually decided uh, to branch out and create his own label cleveland records and he again passionate guy he's got he's got repertoire local repertoire but then steinman gives him a shout and uh, said look i've got this album we can't get arrested with it have a listen steve listened to it he could see it but epic none of the americans could see it epic especially which was the uh, label that was pushing all his uh, tracks through so he called me up and he said judd he said uh I've got this album. He said, a bit of a weird album, he said, but very theatrical. Have a listen. He said, I really want some help on that. I'm just spending a load of money on a video. He said, I'll send the video over. Anyway, he sent the video over. I looked at it and I went, wow, it was an epic. But it was eight, just over eight minutes long. Anyway, we had a conference call. I said, look, let's see what I can do. I'll have a chat with a few people, see whether we can get it shown. And he said, great. He said, that will help kick uh, the ass of uh, the label over here because they're all sitting on the fence. I see Mike Appleton. I go up to see Mike. I said to Mike, look, I've got this eight-minute album here. And as Jill, I think Jill Sinclair was there at the time. And we looked at the video and they went, wow. And it was on the way it worked, as you know, on the whistle test, where you have downtown. If the news finished early, you get a little bit of an extra few minutes. And we were lucky that on the day that Mike stuck his neck on the line and played the whole eight minutes was one of those days where he got a bit of extra time. He put it on there. The reaction was phenomenal. And after that, he said, let's get them over. And I got me over to do uh, Love by the Dashboard, uh, like, you know, that track there with um, uh, Carla. And, um, and it took off. And the UK then started, we started selling shitloads of albums out there we couldn't believe it all our salesmen were saying we need to get more we need to get more the record went in the chart then australia picked up they suddenly started uh, seeing the potential then america suddenly realized we're sitting on something here changed the mind the rest is history yeah, and then marvin yeah. said uh, jim steinman was lovely and um in marvin yeah yeah last time i, I saw me was um where was it, it was in orange county when I played on a Bay City Rollers album. That's another story. But anyway, so Meat, Meat owes a lot to me. But, you know... Um, was he enormously yeah, grateful? Great. I'm sure he was. He was, actually. We had a laugh. Uh, I, I, well, I met him in Essen in Germany 
on tour. And I said, meet, you're in Essen. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, you know what Essen means? He said, no. I said, food. Ah, I love that on stage. You say, Essen, churn Essen. <laughs> anyway, there you go. He was a madman. We had a great laugh. Oh, and the curry. I've got to tell you, no, Wembley curry, when he was doing... When he's doing Wembley, the big, the big, the big first gig he done at Wembley Stadium, and we're we're in rehearsals, and uh, I was over there. We done a couple of interviews, and <laughs> and I said to him, he, he was saying, "Oh, well, a little bit hungry. Anywhere? Where can we go, Judd? Round here?" I said, um, "Well, there's a lovely little Indian across the road. There are lots of Indians around there." So we went in to an Indian, and I did get him a little hot one. And before he used to open with that out of hell, just to you know, the wind up uh, with the guitar opening, the big build up, the big build up. Anyway, anyway, on this occasion, he had a little problem with his tummy. Oh dear! So he had to go by the side of the stage. There's a loo near the uh, near the dressing room, and he he was stuck in the loo for a little bit while the band were going diddly diddly down 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 diddly diddly down down down, and they had to give him a mic in the loo. Before he went on stage, like about it. Oh my god! So there you go. The gig almost didn't happen, or the first number rather. But there you go. How did you? And how did you? I'll let you talk play, now. You, yeah, you, you played harmonica with with Culture Club. You you're on top of pots with Culture Club. Is that right? Do I remember? Yeah, gay boy, gay boy George, the best blowjob he ever had on the harmonica. <laughs> so I, I did not say that. I did not say that. I apologize. When you, yeah, when you recorded well, that, that was, track, they, I mean, they were pretty much unknown, weren't they? Did you think it was going totally, to be Yeah. And it was Steve Levine, uh, in-house producer at uh, CBS, Sony. So obviously the connection there, because if I was doing sessions with them, um, I don't know, you know, the, the Don Henley or uh, ABBA. Uh, ABBA, we used to do a lot of sessions there because there's that stupid musician's union rule where any artist coming in from abroad if there's any strings or whatever they'd have to re-record a track within three hours so i used to use cbs studios all the time steve levine i get in as the producer because he knew how to swap tapes quickly so yes. anyway uh, steve then became uh, you know an independent uh, producer and found culture club and they bonded and he was doing a session at red bus studios by this time, I was now working for Motown, uh, RCA at the time in Bedford Square. Anyway, so I get a phone call from Steve saying, I've got a session on with this band called Culture Club. Um, <clears throat> we're at Red Bus. Could you come over and lay some parts down? And I said, yeah, no problem. I said, send the tape over. Let me have a listen. Sent me a cassette. I had a few ideas. And it was Calm the Chameleon and Church of the Poison Mind. So... I went over there, went in the studio uh, at my lunchtime, went saying, blah, 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 bosh, job done. Oh, this is George. Hello, George. I was thinking, who the hell's that fellow with all ringlets and pinglets? And, you know, so I just thought it was somebody's girlfriend. So I zoomed off and um, went back to the office. So it was all done within the space of a couple of hours. And I carried on with my uh, talking to Lionel Richie about him coming into the UK, just thinking nothing about the track. Next thing is uh, Virgin, um, and I've still got the invoice compliment street from Virgin. Um, so, yeah, so the next thing is they put the record out. They have a hit with the first one. I go, oh, that's quite cool. And then they put Church of the Poison Mind out, and that zoomed up. So that was my first Top of the Pops with Church of the Poison Mind. When, um, who was it, Mike, who was in charge then, producer, Top of the Pops, Mike. Oh, uh, he was quite a stern character. It'll come to me. Don't worry. Anyway, yeah. so, uh, the, the, sorry. No, so sorry, anyway, sorry. so I get on stage, I get, uh, I get on stage dressed up in my Confederate outfit, you know, and sort of with the band and Mike saying, get off the stage. We're ready to take now. Judge, stop pissing about. Get off the stage. Not realizing I was actually playing with the band. So there, there you go. I get on there. I'm playing with the band. Had a great laugh. And I've done quite a few uh, a few bits and pieces there. And they bring out comedy in. And that scorches all the way up to number one. And it became a worldwide number one. One of the biggest sellers of the year and of the time. 
so that was a universal hit. Uh, only this time I go on as a, I think, a, some other character with a skunk on my head. I mean, they used to put some outrageous gear on me. Uh, George wanted to me to wear a dress on the first one, but I refused. <laughs> you know, I stood by my gun. How much did she get paid pay for the session? How much did she get paid for the session uh, for that? 100 quid. 100 quid. Yeah, you could argue well, that the harmonica part is a fantastically important part of the success of that record. Did you write the actual line or did they tell you what to play? Do you know what? I did. And there's a dispute on that one. Is there, is there really? Uh, and that's interesting. There, there was a dispute. So it's like Herbie and Flowers with Walk of the Wild. The side. boys owed me big time because I, I'm a guy of principles and I know it sounds silly. Uh, the guy who, the lawyer came to me uh, the chap who represented um, the violin player in Young at Heart. Oh, yeah, little, yeah. Little, little, little. Yeah, he'd won the case for him. And he was talking to me at a, a do, a record company do. And when I told him about that, he said, did you write it? And I said, yeah, because I created it. I was in the studio. I created that part. Um, and he was saying, well, are you getting, you know, and he, he then started pushing me mentally into suing them. Uh, which a letter, I didn't give him the go-ahead, but he sent a letter on anyway to try and push me into the situation. A letter went to them, and they all panicked, and, you know, Steve called me and said, oh, you're letting the guys down, this, that, and the other. And the stupid thing is, I got paid £100. I accepted the terms at that time of accepting that as a fee. I could have pursued it. It would have soured everything. Would have said, really, I didn't get a royalty. Mm. All I do is I get now payment from obviously when a usage, when it's played in, um, you know, the record stores or, you know. Oh, uh, you do. Well, so you get a performing. You get something. I get a, a performing perform, right. Something. And so right. that at the end of the day, I know I wrote the part. I know, you know, it's a contribution and I'm flattered that people pick up on that. But um, I didn't pursue it. I accepted uh. the terms initially. So, you know, people who say more for me, I just feel within myself it's the right thing. Yeah. So they, they, let's talk about Neil Aspinall a bit. Neil. Yeah, you you, you kind Neil, of knew him over a long period of time. Yeah. Neil was a hung, an unsung hero, I felt, and one that was happy to be so. Uh, Neil was the Beatles Road manager uh, there was Neil and Mal Evans. Neil was the brains. Mal was the muscle, bless his cotton socks. And uh, they took the band everywhere. And Neil was very close to Paul. You know, they were all at school together. Anyway, uh, Neil comes to London with the guys. But Neil was very close with Pete Best as well. And that was always a bit of an awkward position for Neil. But he was, a, he was quite a cool guy. Got through it all. Anyway, when I came to London, as I said, I got the bug of coming to London, wanting to get into the scene. Neil kindly let me stay with his best mate, Billy. That was the connection. Uh, Bill Marchant, who was a cinema, the, uh, the manager of a cinema in Liverpool, but loved his music, was very close with Neil. And Neil had offered uh, Bill and myself uh, uh, to stay with him in Sloan Square, darling, um, uh, for a period of time until we got settled. Uh, in London, and we could get a flat. So it, there's some funny stories there, because when we went in, I, I, I remember it, uh, Sloan Square, the place called Forty House, and it had a concierge, a guy with the hat and everything. And I couldn't believe it. I walked in and said, oh, Jesus, this is cool. And I would get into the And, and Neil said, yeah, you, that's your room over there. Bill, one for you. And it was massive. I've never seen a flat so big. I remember phoning my mum up and saying we could fit our house in this bedroom. Anyway, whilst there, you know, Neil would come back from work and he'd say, uh, oh, Magic Alex has given us a couple of uh, these thingies. Um, Shall we try them? Yeah, we try. Well, I was out in my head most of the time there. Is it just a... It was just a, a mad, it was going through all the funny, druggy phase, he smoking the wacky backy and everything. I remember sitting on the couch reading Melody Maker, and I heard, I don't know how long I've been there, I heard a sitar play, and I pulled my, uh, my paper down, and it was George Harrison. They'd just got back from India, and he'd left some, um, um, what you call it, sitars at Neil's place, and he's playing it in front of me, and I just raised 
the paper up again <laughs> and just uh, carried on reading the paper. And Bill, who was my mate then, he was killing himself, laughing. He was behind saying, I couldn't believe it. You bring the paper up down, seeing George put it up. But I'd never met him before. He just turns up with a flat. And then we'd have nights like John Lennon. Uh, John would pop in late at night out the gate. He'd say, where's Neil? And I'd say, fuck off. I'm having a sleep here. You know, and there's so many, and all the papers, we used to clean his flat up, Neil, as, as a gesture of uh, goodwill. I'm putting papers that Lennon had been writing on, and probably lyrics. We're throwing them out in the bin. So, um, yeah. that, that, you know, that was a fun time. And uh, the, the irony is, I uh, oh, the, the other one, um, oh, Luxembourg, Albert Hammond. I was writing with Albert Hammond for a little bit. We got involved in a project. And it's my first passion, um, you know, writing music. And I wrote a song with him for a band called Cellophane. It was terrible. It was um, for a, a, a festival in Spain. Anyway, we're writing again. And Albert heard that we were staying with Neil and he loved the Beatles. So I took Albert back to the uh, flat and we're having a coffee and I was going to introduce him to Neil. And while we were waiting there, Neil uh, sort of arrived later at night with a, an acetate of Blackbird. And he put it on the uh, on the turntable. He said, what do you think of this, guys? Well, just looking at, um, you know, the faces and and and, and, and he, he was, he, he couldn't believe his luck. He's listening to an acetate of Blackbird. And Neil said to me, what do you think? I said, I think that could be a hit, you know. Silly me, you know, everything. Would just needs a harmonica on it. <laughs> I, no, I suggested... I suggested that I'd play a bit of home. Listen, I ended up playing harmonica on Macca's album. I, I, I Which had one? A, a Flowers in the Dirt. And I think, right. Paul, I think Paul put it on as a gesture of goodwill because at that time, I, I used to hang around Apple all the time because of Neil. And I'd go downstairs and see Porky Peckham. Uh, George was the cutter for all oh, the yeah. stuff. <clears throat> and it was Porky George Pro. who, it was George who was helpful uh, introduced George Harrison to Monty Python. And that's how that film company got together again. Uh, so what happened there was um, George was doing the cutting. I was a charisma. George was doing the cutting of the Monty Python album, the one with the acetate, uh, the runoff grooves and the run-on grooves that were oh, all right. weird. You remember it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So there, so a couple of the Montys are in the cutting room with him. And um, and um, George went outside and saw George Harrison. George Harrison said, are they OK? Are they happy in there? He said, yeah. He said, I'd love to meet them. And and, and Porky Peckham said, George, this is your studio. You can walk yes. in any time. And George was always a shy guy. So, uh, so Porky Peckham said, come on, George, come in, introduce to them. And then they bonded. And then the rest is history. But you know, George right. was great. John Lennon, you like this one? Here's a good one, John. So I pop round to uh, Apple one day, all the girlies outside, and, you know, I'm feeling a little bit Joe Cool, go down to the uh, cutting room. And then I go up and see uh, Neil. And Neil was with John. It was just before John was going to the States, to move to the States. And uh, I'm in there, and we're chatting away. And, uh, and Neil said, uh, what are you doing this weekend? I said, well, I'm going up to Liverpool. I said, I've got to see my mum. And uh, I'm going with uh, Les from the switchboard downstairs. Um, Laurie, sorry, Laurie, the switchboard. She's a scouser as well. She's got the two of us going up to Liverpool. He said, How are you getting up there? I said, Probably getting the bus. He said, Look, look, he said, We're closing down the fan club in Liverpool and we need to get some, uh, some paperwork and bits and pieces back. I've got John's driver going down, uh, you know, to, to, to tell. Do you want a lift? You go down with him, help him. You've got a free lift. I said, great, yeah. And John was that came into the room and he heard the mention about the fan club. And he said, oh, got to give Frieda something. And he signed a check for £100 and gave it to me to give to Frieda Kelly to take all the girls out as a, a thank you for all the years of service. <clears throat> so he said, also, he said, take me big car. I said, which one is that? He said, I've got a white Pullman. I said, what's one of them? He said, you like it, Judd. So, so John's now given me his limousine to go to Liverpool. So there's me and Laurie in the back of this white Pullman, which, you know, it's like about 
two hundred feet long, <laughs> and you got Alf, you got Alf in the front going, "You all right, Dave?" John? I said, "Yeah, great." And I remember he had a microphone in the back of the uh, the limo, black windows. But it, John used to sing and have a mic going down the motorway. People saying, "Doesn't that sound like John Lennon?" And you know, so Did anyway, he so, have a TV in there as well. Yeah, he had to, it was all yeah, because it appears in, in in the Get Back movie, doesn't it? There's yeah, a little aerial it, on the roof. That's right, on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the little aerial. And he had a, a little cocktail cabinet there. There was no drink in it. I was so upset. I could have had. So we, Laurie and I, were having a laugh because we kept stopping at every motorway calf so I could be seen getting out going. Oh, yeah, man, yeah, man. <laughs> I go to the toilet, I get back in. And Alf would say, for buggy's sake, he said, get back in. You're a pain in the arse, you two. We got to Liverpool. And I said, can you drop me off? And I lived in a little uh, estate called for Zachary. Uh, and, and we couldn't get the car around the road. It was so long. I was so disappointed. I wanted to arrive like royalty at my house with my mum going, all right, son. And all the neighbours looking. We never ever did it, but anyway. So that that was that. <laughs> so that was my thing with the, the John Lennon story. That was quite funny. If I would have kept that check now, how much would a hundred pounds uh, be? Absolutely. 60, yes, yes yeah, sixty-eight. And I didn't have a camera at the time. I could have photographed the check. I could yeah. have got the cash and kept the check with John Lennon's signature. Oh, how life oh. is. Fun. Anyway, so I ended up working with Apple and, and plugging by the side. The rock and roll album, you know, Neil said, Can you help out? And I, you know, they gave me a few bob. So I brought that Ringo's album and uh, and George's, but I'd never worked with Paul until I started working with Epic because Paul's office was the other side of Soho uh, Square. Uh, yeah. And um, and there I used to be cheeky and pop over, and um, and Alan was Paul's uh, sort of man in uh, you know, sort of manager at the time. And he was a lovely guy and we really got on well. And I'd go in there and Linda would be nicking cigarettes off me. She said she was packing in, but she'd have a quick, sure, have you got any ciggies? So we got to know each other that way by default. Uh, and the next thing is I get uh, Michael Jack to come into town. And I used to work closely with Michael. He's very, very funny. Um, and uh, always remember, every time Michael arrived on his own, I drove past Buckingham Palace on the way to London Weekend TV to film something um, with Michael. And we passed the palace because we needed to do a shortcut. And the flag was up. And I said, oh, the Queen's in today. Yeah, how do you know that? I said, well, flag up, Queen in, flag down, she's somewhere else. Oh, wow. Can we go in and have a cup of tea? I said, doesn't work like that, Michael. You have to have a, an appointment. <clears throat> anyway, every time Michael Jackson came back into London, and I had to go and collect them at the airport, you know, the work permit and all that bit. We get in the car, we drive off. I'd have to go past the palace. And as we went past the palace, Michael would look out and go, oh, she's not in today, Jed. And then we'd go <laughs> off and do the... This happened time and time again. I took Michael to do an interview at Capital Radio. And we went to Houston Towers. That's where they were based then. Went to thousands of kids outside. We were a little bit early. So I parked up by Lawrence Corner, the old military shop. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yep. yeah, I remember. So we're parked there, and I'm sitting there with Michael making idle chat. And Michael said, Chad, he said, what's there in the window? There's a, a head like those uh, soldiers. I said, it's a military shop. They sell secondhand bits. Oh, Chad, can we go in? I said, well, we've got to be quick. So we sneaked it, and there's this girl there, a little sales assistant, froze. Michael froze. I'm saying, Michael, say hello. Oh, hi. Can I have a look around the shop? So we went around the shop. He bought this. He bought that. He bought this pith helmet he loved. He put this pith helmet on. And we done all the interviews and ended up with the round table. George Harrison, Kid Jensen, David Kid Jensen. And, and, and there's a shot of him with all those, with the pith helmet. And I was the one responsible for the military on Michael's because he bought a load of military jackets that he got oh, altered to wear on stage. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. And then the, the sad thing is, you know, years go by, he dies. I get a call from Nana Nina or Nina Nana um, and quite a few other people. Uh, so ITV then do an interview with me about Michael. And I told the researcher 
about me taking him into Lawrence Corner. How they did it, I don't know, but they managed to find the sales girl. Wow. And she's now, you know, a grown woman with kids. And she got together with me and we recounted that story of him coming in and buying up the shot and then zooming off. So that's quite sweet, that. That's which crazy. gets me back, which gets me back to McCartney. I mean, you're not going to stop me now. I'm on a roll. So anyway, so, so Macca, Michael hears from uh, Morris Oberstein and somebody else. Oh, yeah, Michael, I don't know it's uh, McCartney because he mentioned something about the Beatles. And uh, he said, hey, Judd, he said, um, can I go and meet Paul? You, you know Paul? I said, yeah. And me being Mr. Joe Cool, I had a cameraman with me. Do you remember CBS cameraman? Oh, there were a couple of them, but they're really nice guys. I had them going around taking photographs of Michael with all the Sony staff. And he said, let's take one of you and Michael. I said, no, no, it's not cool, man. I never had, I've got one photograph of Michael presenting him with that award I showed you before. But I haven't got any other photos. I could have had loads. But anyway, long and short of it, I then take him from Soho Square across the green to, uh, I had a chat and uh, Paul was in and introduced them to Paul and Linda. And that's how they bonded. And then they got on well, this, that and the other. The rest is history. The same thing happened with ABBA. They found out that uh, I knew Paul and I took him over. And <laughs> he used to, oh, not again. Here we go. But Paul, we're still in touch. And um, he, he, oh, yeah, the phone. I get the phone call uh, when I'd moved to Chrysalis Records. Uh, I, I've been all over the place. I end up at Chrysalis Records and I'm working on the one and only, which was a big number one. Uh, a bit of an albatross, sadly, for Chesney, but it was still something to be, you know, beholding of, you know, because it was a respectable track. Anyway, while I was there, McCartney calls me, and I'd seen Paul at a couple of dudes, but anyway, he calls me, and the secretary puts the phone down thinking it's someone taking the piss, and he called twice before I actually took the call, and he said, who's that pillock on the... Anyway, he said, look, he said, I've got a track I'd like you to pop down and play on. And it was on the Flowers in the Dirt album. And I went down there and the part he told me to play was actually quite complicated. I mean, he's a brilliant writer. He really works hard at, you know, getting it all together. So long and short of it, um, you know, I, I, I said, can I just do a free, free shot, you know, to try and create something for the end of the track, which I did do. And I sort of played away to my heart's consent. And... I don't think it was what he really wanted, but I think as a courtesy, he just stuck me on the air. I get a credit on the album, and and, and I'm on a play out. Uh, it was, uh, there was a guy in Liverpool interviewed me, and he played the track. He said, I can hardly hear you. I said, I know. It was one of those off days. You know, Paul was focused on something else. <laughs> but anyway, I, yeah, I got, I got a little credit on that. He was great, though. And we're still in touch. I mean, occasionally I see him at Lipper when he presents all the prizes to the students. And he sent me an email not long ago, uh, which was quite sweet. It said, hey, John, take a sad song and make it better. Uh, and I, oh, I that was quite very good. Lovely. That was in lockdown. Very- that was in uh, lockdown. He said, how's your family and yours? He's a lovely guy. And he, he, you know, he's just addicted to performing live. You know, and I can understand it. You know, with all musicians, there's this drug that when you go on a stage, you become alive. Something happens. You get the buzz. I mean, when I done uh, Wembley, uh, uh, the Odeon, I done the Odeon with the Culture Club and Wembley for I don't know how many nights. But there's a, the, 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 you, you just walk out. And there's this adrenaline rush. You must have had it introducing events. It's that adrenaline rush you get, and you can't get rid of it. And I can Paul really understand that. that. So it's yeah. so addictive. Yeah, I know. A starlet you are. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, and that's why he loves gigging. He keeps gigging. Jeff Beck, you know, Jeff's an old mate. And, um, you know, he's 77. He's just been on stage. Well, he's touring now, isn't he, as we speak? Yeah, yeah. So Jeff yeah. is the book there. And you know it's the all story over, about all over the papers. You, you know the story about our Jeff, don't you and me? Go on. Uh, for what you're about to hear, may you be truly thankful. So, I'm at Epic. Jeff Beck has just done a mega deal with Epic US, millions and millions and millions of dollars. But as you know, Jeff is a bit of a reluctant pop star. Oh, this is the time you're going I'm, on the TV to do a TV interview, isn't it? 
Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, go on, go on, go on. Go on. This is yeah, so, so anyway, Morris always here and says, God, got a meeting. Got Jeff Beck's manager coming in, Ernest Chapman. Come up, we're going to meet Ernest. And bring a list of TV shows you get for Jeff, if he do them. So I go up and I meet uh, uh, Obi and everyone. And Anna's saying, uh, what's your... I said, well, there's loads of shows I could get you. And I reel them off, knowing full well he was going to go, no, 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 no. Then we got to the old Grey Whistle test. And I said, he'd be mad to refuse that. He's done it before. So he said, I think he'll do uh, the whistle test. So out of 20, he's willing to do one. And Obi wanted him to do it because we had an album to promote. And they just paid shit loads of money for the album. So long and short, they, um, it's all agreed. I pick up Jeff, take him to the studios, and we do it. And it was live at the time. And it's a big old studio. I can't remember the studio for much. But anyway, so Limousine arranged to pick me up in the Friday morning, take me to Jeff, Tunbridge Wells, to the studio, rock and roll. So Thursday night, I'm in bed. I've had a few to drink. I'm in bed, a little bit tired. Phone goes, and it's Chapman. Judd. Um, Jeffrey can't do the show tomorrow. He's got so many things on. I said, he's got to do the show. I said, the BBC have announced it, both radio and television. There's been a big promotion campaign behind this. He has to do the show. Jeff has uh, a lot of work to do at home. He can't. So he told me he was at home. So the next morning, Limo picks me up. I think, look at this. For some reason, I put a set of bagpipes in the back of the limousine <laughs> and off we go. <laughs> As you do. So I, I, I get to Tunbridge Wells and I've already done my research. And as we get to Jeff's house, he's got this huge pile, two gatehouses, big gates. So as we get closer, I start taking my clothes off in the back of the limo. Well, the driver's getting a little bit concerned and he says, is it hot in the back, Gov? Are you all right? Are you all right? Turn the heating down. I said, no, 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 don't worry. I said, you stay here. You're being paid. If it's 24 hours, you're still getting... So he stopped. I get out, totally stark and naked, with a set of bagpipes. I then march through the gates, and by this time, the little gatehouse keeper's curtains opened and closed. And I'm playing high holes silver lining on the bagpipes, walking down the driveway. Celia, his then girlfriend, comes out, looks at me, screams, runs back in. Jeff comes out with a baseball bat. He looks at me, you know, ready to defend the chateau. And he said, what the you want? What, what the? the? The expletives were unbelievable. I said, I'm from the record company. If I can arrive like this, you can do the bloody show. He said, bug it off. I said, no, you've got to do the show. If I'm going to this, my job's on the line. That's why I'm being a buffoon. Come on, you've got to do the show. Eventually, I put my clothes on and go into the house and have a cup of tea. She's now killing herself laughing. And Jeff's got this little Fender guitar looking at the telly, just ignoring me. I said, I'm not going. He says, well, I'm not doing the show. I said, well, I'm not going. And in the end, he tried every which way to get out of doing the show. And in the end, he sort of little smirk came to his face. And he said, okay, he said, I'll do the show if you come on the show the way you arrive at my house. The rest is history. Is that clip still visible? It's still online. You can googly googly Jeff Beck and Annie Nightingale. I made Jeff's book. I mean, it's Jeff's little book. I mean, Annie's book. And I'm all over the place. I had a cute butt at the time. I was very thin. So you were here in shot, stark naked, playing the bagpipes. Well, you after this little thing, you go and have a look. We're gonna to have to a little it. bit well, of rock and roll we're trivia. We're gonna to have to stop there because we're gonna run out of internet. <laughs> I've got yeah. two. I've got two more hours, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, so listen, you can't see it actually, can you? Go on. What you got to show us there? Go on. Boston, the the Bay City Rollers, who I played oh, with. Uh, the Zabba, there's Cheap Trick, there's the Jacksons, Beatles. Oh, I've got so many things I've kept over the years. I'm a hoarder. Whoops, as he smashes the place up. But there you go. Yeah. Really well, Judd, it's been it's been 
a, quite an, an experience. experience. It's been an <laughs> absolute roller coaster. Should we ask Judd, Dave, the greatest yes. record of all time? Well, that's the traditional yeah. end to these things. Is you have to nominate the greatest record ever made, single or album, whatever. The greatest record. <laughs> greatest record. There is ever made. No, there are so many. There are so many. Um, well, pick one. Well, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. Do you know what? I One I love, and it, it's a bit cheesy, The Winner Takes It All by Abba. Fair enough. Fair enough. Because of the story and the sentiment and knowing what they went through when I was working with them. So it has a lot of meaning there. You know, it may be cheesy to a lot of people. Uh, you know, I love B.B. King. Uh, I love, you know, so many other artists. But Abba, I mean, they are clever writers, and that song was so personal. I love it. Thank you. That'll well. do. That'll <laughs> do. That was really, really entertaining. Uh, Word in your attic. A zoom with a view.